Alrighty, folks, uh, we are now well into March already of 2024. And uh, like we talked about on a previous episode uh, about rule making predictions for the rest of this year, the first domino has fallen on the rule making calendar. DOD has issued the DIBCS final rule, expanding eligibility for non cleared contractors. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But first, some housekeeping. We are now just a couple weeks away from CS2 Boston. There's still uh, seats available in person. There are still slots available virtually. The agenda is finalized up on the CS2 website. Podcast listeners get a discount with the code SUMMITUPBOSTON, all caps. You can find it in the episode description below. A bunch of people have been using the code, so thank you very much. And uh, yeah, so we're going to actually talk about one of the folks who's going to be speaking at CS2 as we dive into this DIBCS rule, because some people who are uh, in charge of implementing the tenets of the DIBCS rule are going to be there presenting. We're just a couple days out from St. Patrick's Day, and I would say that this is the luck of the Irish, right? Except for not necessarily the pot of gold is directly in front of us, right? Um, but we see what the pot of gold is, and the pot of gold is free resources uh, that have been opened up to. <laughs> it didn't matter. It didn't matter what we were going to talk about this week. You were going to make a, a St. Patty's Day reference, right? I mean, I mean, you had to. It didn't I mean, matter. My it but, yeah. but yeah, so the, the pot of gold, you know, is free resources and free resources that are very beneficial if understood correctly. Um, and and I, I think that it's great that now, uh, realistically, the um, availability to or the eligibility to enroll in, in the DIPCS program um, has uh, extended to at least 10 times the audience, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, for those of you that are not aware, we'll just go through the quick overview and the highlights of what's going on in the rule. You should definitely read the final rule for sure, as always. Uh, so on March 12th, the DOD published a final rule that is officially expanding eligibility criteria to participate in the DIB cybersecurity program, what's known as the DIB CS program. And the boilerplate from the rule, the DIB CS program is a voluntary program to enhance and supplement participants' capabilities to safeguard DOD information that resides on or transits DIB unclassified information systems. Uh, it's a threat intel information sharing program. It is a forum for receiving uh, sensitive uh, information about ongoing incidents, ongoing cybersecurity campaigns, ongoing threats, uh, and also for reporting and uh, sharing your perspective of what's going on in your environments. And this sort of fusion center of sharing information is the platonic goal of government cybersecurity, if you will, because these information sharing centers, these threat intel uh, exchanges are the main top level goal that you always hear about from the Office of the National uh, 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 Cyber Director, from CISA, from the Solarium Commission, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. It's always there has to be an exchange of information up to the government and an exchange of threat intel information back down from the government. Now, as we've talked about in the past, the problem with that is, is that if you get a bunch of threat intel reporting thrown over the wall, into a bunch of organizations that don't have the correct precursor controls to ingest and operationalize the information, it doesn't really go anywhere, right? Like if you get a bunch of indicators of compromise of an active campaign that's targeting DIB companies and you have no logging, no visibility, no granular access control, no configuration baselines to judge what's normal or not, then uh, you're, 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 in a, you're in a boat without a paddle. You can't tell what's going on. You have no ability to navigate. That's a separate problem. Uh, outside of that problem, the DIBCS program is actually very good at what it does. So uh, like we said, it's a threat intel information sharing program. The rule was published on March 12th. It goes into effect on April 11th. So the actual effective date of the expanded criteria is April 11th. And it just so happens that at CS2 the week before, we're going to have Terry Kalka, who works for the Defense Cyber Crime Center, specifically as the director of an organization called DICE, the DOD Collaborative Information Sharing Environment, D-C-I-S-E, pronounced DICE. 
you got to let the government have their acronyms and pronunciations. So he's the director of DICE, the operational arm of the Defense Cyber Crime Center, DC3, uh, which is, you know, sort of overall in charge of making the DIBCS program happen. So they have regular events throughout the year, uh, these threat intel exchanges that typically people have only been able to participate in if they had a facility clearance and were also participants in the DIBCS program. So Terry is going to be at CS2 explaining all about the DIBCS program, what it is, what it means, how to participate, why it's beneficial, uh, what it will do for companies, uh, as well as some very interesting tales from the front uh, uh, coming out of uh, success stories from the from the DIBCS program. Yeah, so one of the the big things that comes from that DIPCS program also is uh, remediation strategies that are shared, right? You know, in mm. my shoes, this is what I did to combat this, right? Right. And, and so for people that may not have that um, staffing and capability within their organization or, or providers that, you know, just need more insight, um, this is a very, very important thing for them to participate in um, because um, perfect example is is um, there is a requirement in CMMC NIST 800 that says that you must alert on activities within your environment, mm -hmm. XYZ, right? Well, what activities is a question that you always get as a consultant. What activities am I supposed to alert on? And these are things that are deemed relevant activities that you might want to monitor within your environment. Indicators of compromise from a particular um, adversary are yep. things that you would adjust your playbooks for to, to, to monitor for. So this is all a part of this big puzzle, right, Jacob? It, it's, yeah, it's a absolutely. part of, you know, building that, the, 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 the importance of building out the cybersecurity program that is required of NIST 800 and then using the resources that are given and now more resources now being made available to more people and leveraging those appropriately to uh, uh, track what adversaries are doing and keep adversaries out from getting your data, stealing your data and, and compromising your systems. Yeah, so they talk about this throughout the rule, so that's why people should definitely read it. They talk about this as being one cog in the wheel of this overall effort to try to improve DIB cybersecurity, and they're not wrong. It, it's a solid, it's a solid program. the The crazy part when you zoom out from the fact that the rule is final and it's going into effect in April, and now people can participate is the DIB CS program is twelve years old. The DIB CS program has been in existence for over a decade, and for twelve years. Uh, you needed a facility clearance of secret or higher to participate. So the only people in the in the DIB who could get access to threat information about cybersecurity threats f actively happening in the DIB were people who had facility clearance, which is an incredibly small amount of the companies that actually make up the DIB. So you know, in the rules, which you know, I'll, I'll spare people the the uh, the enjoyment of of recounting every one of the rules over the last twelve years. They, they go through and they're like, why is participation so low? And you're like, I don't know, maybe because most people don't have a facility clearance. Did you ever think of that? Anyways, uh, as as silly as that is, now any any company, the criteria for participating in the DIBCS program is any company that operates a covered contractor information system, no longer uh, a company with a secret facility clearance or higher. And for those of you at home, looking at you, CCPs and CCAs especially, uh, what does DFAR 7012 define a covered contractor information system as? It is an unclassified information system that is owned or operated by or for a contractor, in contrast to the government, that processes, stores, or transmits covered defense information. Covered defense information being the umbrella term that DOD uses for any form of CUI that the DOD sends you. Right. So if you get CUI from the DOD and you put it on your information systems, that information system is a covered contractor information system. This is important within the context of 800 because that that's what determines a lot of your scope for the applicability of your cybersecurity requirements. Here, if you operate a covered contractor information system, that is, if you have CUI from the DOD, then you are eligible to participate in the DIB CS program. You fill out an application, you sign an agreement form, and then Bob's your uncle. Some magic happens in the Rube Goldberg machine after April 11th, and then you can participate in the DIB CS program. We'll let Terry explain the details of how that's supposed to work on the back end. I'm sure it will be very smooth and there won't be any hiccups whatsoever. Now, the DOD estimates in this rule, here comes our favorite estimate again, that there are 80,000 companies subject to mandatory incident reporting under DFARS 7012. 
That's another way of saying they think there are 80,000 companies that have CUI sent to them from DOD. We've heard this estimate since like 2021. Uh, this also shows up in the CMMC rule, shows up in some interviews at the end of 2021 when the DOD came out of their, <laughs> their hibernation uh, uh, drum circle that they were doing for all of 2021, trying to review the CMMC program. They think there's 80,000 companies that would be CMMC level two because they have CUI. As a result, there are 80,000 companies that have to report incidents mandatorily under DFAR 7012. Therefore, there are 80,000 companies, according to their estimate, that would be eligible to participate in the DIBCS program. Longer story, we've talked about this in the past, they don't know how many companies have CUI. And I'm not really sure how they're going to verify uh, your claim that you have a covered contractor information system. Uh, so that's an interesting question that we should ask Terry at CS2. I've always said that that 80,000 company estimate is uh, basically um, the most known awareness that the DOD has as to how far they think that the CUI reaches right. based on their control of it, right? right? But what we've talked about many times on many episodes is the fact that there are parts where this clause is flowed down to companies that may not touch that CUI and they do not know about it and they cannot regulate that. Meaning that this, no, actually not meaning, I, I have a question. If I'm one of those companies and the DOD doesn't think I'm one of those 80,000, but I have this 7012 clause flow down to me, that now makes me eligible for the DIBCS program. <clears throat> well, not quite. And so this is actually oh. a cool, this is actually a cool twist on something that we've talked about before. There's so, always a twist, Jacob. There's always so a twist. A lot of times what we talk about in the DFAR 7012 clause is the pressure that it puts on companies to negotiate the clause out of their contracts. Because when you go back and you read the rules, You'll find that in 2016, the DOD came up with the good idea. It's a very, very good, bright idea of putting DFAR 7012 into all contracts by default in order to protect their risk, right? Now, not all companies get CUI as a result of dealing with their contracts, either sent to them or generated uh, underneath that contract. So everyone has the clause. Not everyone has the data. If you leave the clause in your contract, and your customer wakes up one day and decides to say, you accepted the clause, therefore you have to get a cert and we're not going to pay you because you attested to already doing the thing in the clause, then you're screwed. And that's a big problem. Here, however, the DOD says, everyone with a covered contractor information system gets to participate in our program, but to prevent a flood, which I'm sure will not actually be the problem, but to prevent a flood of people from trying to participate in the program, they have a line that says the presence of the clause in a contract does not establish that covered defense information is being shared. So they're actually coming from a different direction here. Just because you have the clause does not mean you have the CUI. Wait. Just because you have the clause does not mean you have a covered contractor information system. Just because you have the clause does not mean you have you get to participate in the DIBCS program. So now, even, even though... Or as if it wasn't uh, very, very important to know what is CUI in your system and if you get CUI within your system. Now it's equally as more important because they're going to say, I have the clause and this is the CUI that I have here. Well, do I don't know. Pay. Is that how they're going to determine it? And this I is don't know. <laughs> because the clause itself has a, um, a paragraph in it that says that you, uh, that, that deals with the flow down of the clause itself, right? You know, uh, we always came up with. And, and why would you as a contract <laughs> officer flow down a clause to a subcontractor uh, that requires them to put protections to protect CUI unless you expected them to have to <clears throat> process, store, or transmit CUI. Well, here's a question for you as we're, this just sort of popped into my mind as we're talking. What happens if you go to uh, your customer and you say, I'm not receiving CUI, take the clause out. And they say no. And then you go to apply to participate in the DIBCS program and they say, you don't operate a covered, a covered contractor information system. If I have it in writing from the, from the DIBCS program that I don't Spider qualify mean. for the program, does that mean that I get to opt out of having yeah. to have oh, DFAR 7012 yeah. applicability and therefore CMMC? Does everyone listening to this podcast now have a hack to figure out if CMMC actually applies to you by using the, the DOD's uh, momentum yeah, with, them with, our, with our podcast Tai Chi here? Where you're like, oh, I'll show you that I actually don't have these requirements applicable to me because they won't let me participate in their threat intel program. So clearly, I don't need a CMC certification. That's a spicy meatball that we just came up with live. That's a great. We're gonna have to talk about that one some more. I, we're gonna have to ask Terry about that one because Dude, if, Terry, I, if Terry says you can't play over here, 
then I'll be like, <laughs> great. Thanks, Tear. Because yeah, I'm not playing with this. I'm not going to play. Not, a season, not saying know? it excuses you not having protections on your system, right? Of course. But the fact of the matter is, is that might be a lot more ingestible if it's not 400,000 companies that are getting it just because <laughs> everybody is throwing CUI labels on contracts like Frank, Frank's Red Hot, right? Like it's just like, bam, bam, bam. Put it bam, on bam. everything. Put it on everything. Okay. So some other highlights and good moves that are in the rule, legitimate good things that are in the rule. Great news, everybody. You no longer need a medium assurance certificate to be able to report cyber incidents pursuant to your obligations under DFAR 7012. I know that everybody listening to this podcast knows that of the 13 paragraphs in DFAR 7012, one of them imposes mandatory cyber incident reporting requirements on you. And in the text of the clause, it says in order to do so, you need a medium assurance certificate to verify your identity in order to log into the, the portal and report the incident. As we know, non-podcast listeners are they very rarely have the medium assurance certificate, which tends to be a big problem when DibCAC shows up and goes, uh, you don't even have the certificate to report the thing if you have an incident and then you got to wait a week to get, it's a big problem. You no longer need the certificate to. Can report. you imagine if that was like part of the statistics that they did for their assessments? I bet you FIPS would have competition as the number one other than satisfied control for the medium certificate. Oh, I, you're talking about the I, other paragraphs of 7012? Yeah, oh, medium assurance yeah, certificate yeah, is definitely the number one thing. Yeah, dude, because not. like, I, I can tell you, I, I may not, and this is no knock because you, you don't know what you don't know, right? And, sure. and, and and the fact is, is that they don't know that this is needed. They know that, so, that they're just getting around that 171 is right. needed because it's new to them. They're getting around to the FedRAMP you know, needs, which are a whole different beast in itself. And then hidden down there, a couple more paragraphs. Hey, you need insurance to get that. Yeah. Policy, right. Now, this is and, why. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. No. Yeah. I just I'm saying like it's very rare that I run into an organization when I was consulting. Oh, yeah. Um, that they, I was like, OK, so do you have a medium assurance certificate? Just going through the paragraphs of 7012 before getting into the, right. the meat and potatoes of 171. Right. right. And, and, and that was really a hiccup at the beginning. Well, and this is this is why it's important to pay, pay attention to rulemaking, because if you read your DFAR 7012 clause, it says you need the medium assurance certificate. The new Dib CS rule says you don't need the medium assurance certificate. So hmm. if you weren't aware of this Dib CS program rule, you'd have to go through the rigmarole of ordering the cert, paying for it. It's not that expensive, but it's still a non-zero amount of money and time that you have to deal with. And something you got to think about, something that you could potentially get hemmed up on. As of this rule, you no longer need the cert. So we know that DFAR 7012 rulemaking will eventually happen sometime later this year. And I'm sure that when that happens, the language around needing a medium assurance certificate will come out because this rule now says you no longer need it for reporting. But that's why it's important to continuously sort of pay attention to what's coming out in the rules because they don't always match identical, you know, they're not always identical in terms of what the most recent information is. Well, so let's backpack on that rule, right? Like, like what comes out in the rules and things that uh, have applied in the rules and then, you know, things that we know apply in the CMMC space, especially when it comes to small, medium sized businesses, right? Um, a lot of the things that uh, threat intelligence, and, and you made this point in the beginning, you know, you get this stuff, but if you don't know what to do with it, it's pointless, right? So yeah, a lot of these like, companies like, actually hey, seven, out. what is they're it like 70 like plus percent of the div? And I don't mean to like talk over here, we can, you know, going back and yeah, forth yeah. or whatever, but like 70 plus percent of the div, aren't they reliant on external service providers? Oh, so yeah. they would, would it be a case where if my company had an external service provider, I would have to enroll in the Dib CS program take all that information, then act as the middleman and relay it to my service provider who then would enact it on my right, behalf? Right. Or what, 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 what's in it for providers? Is gotta, there anything go, in it for providers for the gotta, You got to pass messages between mom and dad to figure out yeah. like, what's going on. Yeah. So And you play the like, game of telephone and part of it's missed along the way, right. you know, like. So as stipulation of the rule, which is another good move, third party service providers can participate in the Dib CS program. Now this gets work. a little weird in practice. So we'll have to see how this plays out because third-party service providers are not contractors. MSPs generally don't get the DFAR 7012 clause flowed to them. They don't operate covered defense or covered contractor information systems. So they would not normally fall under the mandatory incident reporting clause of the DFAR 7012 clause itself. Uh, but this rule says that if a uh, company that does operate such a system is participating, that they can basically vouch for their third-party service provider MSP to also participate in the DIBCS program, which overall is a great move.
because they're ultimately the ones that are going to need to operationalize that information anyways. And mm -hmm. they even talk about in the rule that third party service providers can be authorized to report incidents on behalf of their clients to the DOD to sort of cut out the middleman in terms of incident reporting. That's very interesting. That's very helpful. That's very efficient. I wonder how MSPs will uh, embrace or not the ability for them to declare an incident and for the MSP to report an incident on behalf of a defense contractor to the DOD, right? Because right. that could get into a potentially dicey situation. And then there's another thing too, and this is a wrinkle. I So one of the things, and you know, um, I spent a long time going down a rabbit hole with uh, free the free services offered to the DIB, you know, the DIB yeah. CS program, and I say all of the, uh, the things that are offered there. And um, one of the conditions, even when we were discussing here internally how to use it, is that if you receive the information from this as like in your provider, like you cannot enact it into your delivery package and deliver it to people that aren't a part of the program. So you would ultimately have to have two sets of delivery mechanisms, right? Two SIM playbooks, two whatever that you do for the, the uh, for the client, because you cannot, the, even though it sounds so counterproductive to the actual intent of the program, right? We want everybody to know all this and have all these in place to stop the compromise unless you're not a part of the program. And I wonder if that is a provision that is now lifted now that the rule has expanded the the, the um, eligibility, right? Um, yeah. Because uh, before, like you said, it was kind of like an elite group, right? Like it was a group that we, you're in yeah, sensitive super, areas. There was less than a thousand companies in the entire DIB that participated in this program at all. But I also feel <laughs> like that that's at that point in time when the program was created, A, maybe resources constrained, how many organizations could enroll in it and they wanted to limit the scope, or B, maybe that's the realistic attack surface that the DOD thought that there was. And then they realized uh, that I'm gonna, it was starting I'm gonna, deeper. I'm throwing, I'm th I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going right. to throw the flag. Having read the rules and the public comments on the rules in the past, really what it was uh, for the most part was the, the DOD and the participants in the program are very sure. afraid of sharing information about what's going on in terms of them not, them experiencing incidents the sensitivity of the information. And so there's like a big, I'm sitting here and I find out Jacob's company had a threat. And then I tell there's everybody a Jacob's big, company has big a threat. contradiction yeah, out there. There's a big, big contradiction out there and everybody mm -hmm. knows it. Everybody knows it, not name and names. Everybody knows it. Everybody talks about sharing information, sharing threat intel information. Yeah, and there are some major defense industry groups, not naming names that are in charge of facilitating these processes. And the participants are very closed off from letting the everyman, normal, lay person, small business from participating in a program that could objectively help them uh, quite a bit. So I'm glad to see that the DOD took the initiative uh, in front of some of the large industry groups that uh, <laughs> haven't been doing that. Okay, so move, move, moving on, moving All on right, before, buddy. before we get, before we get, yeah, they cut the line here. Uh, so what does it mean for CMMC compliance? We've already talked about how there isn't a lot of overlap between a lot of the free services and offerings from the DOD versus the actual specific requirements that you have pursuant to DFAR 7012. Uh, so ultimately what DOD is going to do, almost certainly in the CMMC final rule, is they are going to point to expanded eligibility for participation in the DIBCS program as a key tenant of the resources and tools and help that they're extending to the DIB to help with cybersecurity, even though it doesn't directly help with the even a, a small minority of your requirements under 800-171. It is a critical part to making your overall control environment work well. It is a critical part to making sure that it's actually a decent program informed by threats but when it comes down to brass tacks in which line items in 171A does this satisfy and I no longer have to worry about, very, very, very few of those assessment objectives will actually be satisfied. That being said, just to reiterate, it is a good program. People should participate. It's way past due that they expanded eligibility, and it's, a, it's, it's a overall a good thing, and people should do it. Yeah, it's so we, we talk about compliance security, but not being equal. And I'm not going to get you all riled up and red faced right now. Right. Um, but th there's that there's conversations out there. But then we have one of the best presentations I ever sat through at a CS2, Scott Goodwin, who tells us how you can take the compliance requirements and make good security. Right. You take compliance requirements. CS2 Boston, by the way. So, yeah. 
Um, it's earning you champ. Take, oh, good one. You take the compliance requirements to have alerts, like I mentioned before, and the good security is taking that extra step and learning about the TTPs of the threats that are applicable to your your organization, right? Whatever your organization does, whether it's critical infrastructure, whether you're an insurance agency, doctor's office and whatnot, then you take and you translate that into alerts to monitor for that behavior. That is taking compliance and turning it into good security. Yeah. Yeah. Scott's very good at translating all of the, he's probably the best person at translating and bridging the world of compliance versus security because he's a, he's a freaking pen tester. He's yeah. the guy out there actually doing the spookiness. And it's so refreshing to hear him present because he'll sit there and say, these are good requirements. And if you do them properly, it makes my job all, way harder and a, almost impossible. The, one of my favorite parts about what he talks about in his presentations is he'll say, I'm going to exploit this system and it has nothing to do with any of the vulnerabilities or patches that may or may not be in your system. We're going to be doing this in other ways. And so your architecture, your configuration baseline, your access your control settings, those are the things that are going to make his job a lot harder, not just sort of going through vulnerability and patch management, which are always like the top things that you hear uh, on, your on, people. On, on these recommendations. Your people, yeah. your people. All right. So that's just sort of what happened in terms of the rule. We're just going to... We're just going to take a minute here and talk about uh, the policy background of what's going on with this rule. You it's can the get big, one episode out without talking about it. It's the about... big picture piece that makes everything sync up together because the, the world is just a lot smaller whenever you can recall these dusty reports and sections of NDAAs and things like that. So for those of you who are interested, we're just going to connect the dots here as to why this happened. What DOD is going to say, I guarantee you, what DOD is going to say is we've expanded eligibility because it's good and we've expanded eligibility because it helps and we've expanded eligibility and <clears throat> it will help with CMMC and on and on and on. And all of those things are not untrue, but those are not the reasons why they actually did the rule. The reasons why they did the rule comes down to money, their money, right? And so... The Cyberspace Solarium Commission, actually three years ago this month, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission released their initial report. This commission is one of the most influential commissions in recent history on any policy, uh, regardless of what domain it happens to occur in. And it's by far the driving factor in what national cyber regulation, national cyber strategy looks like as a result of this report. We have an office of the National Cyber Director because of the Solarium Commission report, right? Uh, they talked about all these things to help with the CMMC program. They talked about all these different aspects of what are now sort of givens in the national cyber strategy uh, as a result of this report. And it's a big, long report. It's very interesting. It's only three years old, but I can't believe it's already been three years kind of a thing. Anyways, we'll link to it below. Section 6.2.1 specifically says, this is back in 2020, require the defense industrial, sorry, require defense industrial based participation in a threat intelligence sharing program. And the report says, information sharing programs exist, but are insufficient. For example, the DOD Cyber Crime Center, DC3, and the DIB Cybersecurity Program, DIB-CS, are largely voluntary, although DIB entities have mandatory reporting requirements. Good job, Cyberspace Solarium Commission, pointing out the fact that you are you are required to report incidents, but it's voluntary to participate in incident reporting, sharing and information. Doesn't really make any sense, right? Now, an interesting aspect here that uh, they that we haven't heard in a while, the Solarium Commission report says drawing on DoD's CMMC regulation. The requirements associated with participation in a threat intel sharing program should be tied to a firm's level of maturity. That's very interesting because here they're saying, well, what happens if you're at a certain level of maturity on the certification scale under CMMC? Is there a certain point at which you are mandated and required to participate in something like the DIB-CS program? And then they finally close out, this is from 2020, and they say, in addition, the government should communicate particularly to small and medium-sized companies, the incentives for participation. Great, whatever, this big report comes out. Most people don't read it. Most people don't even know that it happened three years ago. Anyways, they have an annual implementation report that comes out every year. And 
I remember reading this last year, but it didn't really click until this final Dib CS rule came out. So in September of last year, they released their implementation report and section 6.2.1 uh, mandate Dib participation in threat intel sharing. They have it marked in bright green, uh, uh, nearing implementation or partial implementation, which means the recommendation is included in legislation or an executive order that has a clear path to approval or it is partially implemented in law and policy. And they recap the story of how we got to the Dib CS program rule. And they say the FY21 NDAA partially implemented this recommendation to require participation by requiring an assessment of the viability of the threat intel sharing information program for the defense industrial base. So in, in FY21, the NDAA directed the DOD to assess the capability of expanding the Dib CS program, essentially, right? So the Cyberspace Solarium Commission report drove a section in the NDAA that drove the DOD to think about expanding participation, right? Very important to remember. Then the, uh, let's see, then two years later, the FY23 NDAA limited the availability of certain funds until congressional committees receive the cybersecurity assessments of the DIB as required by the FY21 NDAA. So that was the section that required the DOD to assess themselves against CMMC requirements and then report it back. And also as part of that effort, the DOD won't get their money, they won't get their budget until they finish wrapping up the ability to assess expanding participation in the DIBCS program. And then uh, in May of 2023, sure enough, they issue a proposed rule that says, hey, we're going to expand participation in the DIBCS program, right? So just for those that are curious, uh, when you hear the DOD say, we're expanding participation in the DIBCS program, it's a good thing. When you hear them say, we're expanding participation in the DIBCS program because we believe organically that it's a good thing to do, that's not exactly true. They're expanding participation in the DIBCS program because they weren't going to get paid. And there's nothing that will motivate a, a defense or a, a government agency like withholding budget until they do a thing. And that's really how we got to the Dib CS program rule that expands. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, just, I'm, just, just I don't so know how to react. All, I don't think we've ever yeah. been in an episode where two spicy meatballs were <clears throat> yeah. dropped. At I mean, does it really matter? No, it doesn't really matter because everybody gets to participate now. But let's just, you know, let's all be honest here about what's going on. The CMMC program didn't emerge because the DOD organically decided that they wanted CMC. It emerged because Congress told them to come up with a framework to verify implementation. DIBCS program eligibility doesn't exist uh, in an expanded form because the DOD decided organically that they were going to expand it. It got expanded because they got told to expand it. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. there's always a reason a lot of times why the DOD, when it comes to cybersecurity policy, does a thing. And it's usually in reaction to something very bad happening or threats of budgets getting reduced. So just so you know, the more you know. <laughs> how, how do you react to that? Uh, like what do, what do I, I say? What do it. I say? I, what yeah. do I say right now? Like you know, like, I just find well, it interesting. Yeah, let's. Well, I'll, interesting. I'll be the positive Nelly. Well, at least we have some good things for the Dib to use on their journey. You know, like hundred percent. Yeah, so 100%. That, that's how it is, man. Yeah, the hundred percent. So that's something to look out for whenever you see if anybody ever skims through the NDAAs, all three thousand pages of them <laughs> every year. Anytime you see somebody say we're not going to pay you until you do a thing, you can be guaranteed they're going to do that thing because there's a bunch of stuff. That gets put in the NDA every year. Reports and analyses and presentations that are due within 180 days, 270 days, they never happen, right? They never happen. They just get kicked down the road. They get done years later. Uh, when there's a when there's a budget stipulation, that's when stuff gets done. So, uh, so there you go. Anyways, Dib CS program is open uh, as of April 11th. We're going to talk about it at CS2 with the people who know best. Uh, and now you know a little bit more about uh, the what's really going on behind dod motivations do you see my face dude like i i, I that's it that was a good one that was there you go. way to go bud all right everybody see you next week see you next week <laughs>